uh, Professor Barr is uh, not in the country, so I'm going to say good evening, Dr. Barr. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sorry it's so dark here, but it is, yeah. It's, it's night. It's, it is night. <laughs> uh, thank you for being with us and for that outstanding lecture. You know, again, um, I want to remind people that unlike talks that you might hear from people about science, um, Dr. Barr has produced much of the science that that he's and, and his observations that he's discussing. I know there are a lot of questions about, about this that um, range from what to eat to how to exercise, et cetera. Um, so let me just jump right in, Keith. Um, you know, you ended with collagen. Um, if people take collagen, doesn't it just get metabolized? Doesn't it just get digested in the stomach? How does it get from our mouth to our tendons? Sure. So, so it's a great question. Just like everything that we eat is going to be broken down. Um, we don't ingest any of the proteins that we that we take in as whole proteins. We break them down into small either very small peptides or just the amino acids that make them up. And the reason that dietary collagen might be useful is that what dietary collagen is, it's unique about it, is that it's very high in this amino acid glycine and it's very high in um, proline. And so these two amino acids are two of the more difficult ones to get from dairy proteins or from, or from plant-based proteins in general. And so what we're what we what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to have the building blocks that you need, because every time I make this big, huge piece of collagen, this big, huge collagen protein, what I'm doing is I'm actually using glycine every third amino acid. And I'm using proline every third amino acid. And if I don't have enough of those because they're not coming into my diet, I do make glycine. And, and so so it's not going to be as limiting, but it in those situations where say I'm exercising and I'm, I'm driving myself and I'm trying to go hard, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to start using more glycine than is readily available from my diet. And that becomes then what we call a conditionally essential amino acid. So what we're doing, yes, we're breaking our collagen down in our gut. We're producing amino acids, maybe a couple of peptides, but those amino acids are really going to be primarily the things that our cells are then gonna use as building blocks. Because all, all their cells are doing is just building proteins, like you're building a wall. You need the bricks to build your wall. Got it. And so I think many are probably thinking then, if you're a vegan or you're a vegetarian, are you just, are, are you just destined to not be able to rebuild your tendons um, if, if you can only get this from animal products? So, so it doesn't it doesn't have to be that way. There are some sources of glycine in um, in the in the plant world that are pretty good, um, but we do find that if if you're not in, intentional, um, that what happens is that people do become a little bit low in it. And so, what you know, we're working with a company right now who's trying to produce a. Um, they're trying to produce what they call a recombinant uh, gelatin or recombinant collagen. And so, so the reason that they're doing that is because the majority of, of, of sources are actually coming from, from animal world. And so there are a couple of, of decent sources. Soybean is, is the primary one where soybean, I think its Latin name is actually glycemia because it is so rich in the amino acid glycine. But if you're not intentional about your eating as a vegetarian and you don't go out and find those proteins that are going to help you, that's when you get into problems. So a lot of our young athletes who are vegetarian because they're eating clean, like eating a salad, they're not necessarily intentionally bringing in things like those soy proteins that are gonna be rich in glycine and they do make themselves a little bit more prone for injury. So um, should should collagen be part of a, a of a daily um, diet? Should should we be supplementing collagen on a daily level, a daily basis? So so again, it's a lot of things are possible. Um, I can tell you that I do. Um, I'm in my fifties. That doesn't mean that I'm you know old, but what it means is that you know. I'm already starting the decline of things. And so, yes, I take it daily because the other reason I take it daily is because if I exercise in the morning, like I tend to do, 
the collagen synthesis rates in my tendons and my cells that are activated, that actually doesn't peak until about 24 hours later. So yes, what I do now is going to combine with the amino acids that are present now. But then when I exercise the next day, I'm also going to get a benefit from what I had from the exercise I did yesterday and from the new amino acids that I'm getting today. So, so uh, what we like is a regular basis. So if you take it every day in the morning, that's great. In the evening, that's great. And if you're going to take it every day, then you do want to look for something that comes from a skin source or from a fish source that doesn't have as much heavy metal in it. Got it. And, um, you know, in terms of, you know, you talked about really the idea of stress for the body is Absolutely. good if done, if done thoughtfully. Yep. When is when is exercise too much? Could you just say a few words about that? Yeah, so so stress in in general is something that our bodies need in order to develop properly and in order to be maintained properly. But all stresses come together. And so the big thing that we have to do is when we have stresses coming from outside from the rest of our life, if we're not sleeping well, if we're if we're traveling a lot, if we're doing all these other things that are providing us stress, then what's going to happen is you're going to come in and you what you need to actually do is you need to also realize that now when I'm exercising at this level that I've been exercising at for years, but now as the stresses in my life have gotten bigger, now that relative stress of that exercise bout is, is greater. And so there are going to be times when our life is stressful where we decrease some of the intensity or the duration of the exercise that we do. And that's where we can do things that are more you know, instead of going out and doing something, maybe like a like a big run there, maybe we're going to do something where it's going to be more of a, a yoga based move where I'm going to do isometric holds where I can basically hold those positions for 30 seconds, get that load across the tissue, decrease the the overall general stress, but still give me the stress through the systems that I need in order to maintain my mobility and to keep my body working. So, um, you know, we, we have a short period of time here and only a few more minutes. So I'm going to ask a few other questions. These questions are coming from the audience. Um, mm -hmm. And one that, you know, one that keeps coming is, you know, about um, getting protein in the diet and, and the difference between plant-based protein and uh, uh, animal-based protein. And you, you, you did say at one point in your talk about getting protein or from meat. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like that's the best source or are they equivalent? What should people think about that? So, so again, it, it's all depending on what you're, a bunch of different things. But the rule of thumb is that the protein availability from plants is lower. So all that means is if you are a vegetarian, that instead of eating 20 grams of protein, you're actually shooting for more like 40 grams of the total protein within the plant, because you're only actually going to be able to digest and absorb about 20 grams of it. So what my colleague here in Maastricht that, I'm, that I've come to work with is, has done is he's done direct comparisons of plant to animal. And all he has to really do is double the amount of protein coming from the plant-based source. And the response is the same. But again, that can become a lot of food. And so you do need to take into account that the easiest thing a lot of times is to take something that is either animal-based or is a hydrolyzed, a hydrolyzed protein source from, an, from a plant-based source. So you can do a pea protein and there's even, they're studying here potato protein. They're studying all kinds of different vegetable proteins. They all work. It's just they tend to need more of a, a higher dose than you would get from, from the animal-based proteins. So the rule of thumb I gave you for young people was 0.25 grams per kilogram body weight. If, I'm, if that young person is a, is a vegetarian, they're going at 0.5 grams per kilogram body weight. I said an older person about 0.4, so now they're getting up about 0.8. That's a lot of protein. And so that's when adding something in like a like a protein powder can be useful because it's concentrated it's not going to be as filling and it's going to allow you to get the protein that you need Keith, i i i'm i'm going to end, end here by just adding my my perspective that when i've asked people that protein question from experts all over the world there's a wide um variety of opinions on that so we appreciate hearing yours I can't thank you enough for um, coming here from with us from from uh, uh, the Netherlands. Um, 
uh, continue a successful sabbatical. We all thank you for your time, an outstanding lecture, and uh, we'll see you back in the States. Thank you very much. Take care and enjoy the rest of the day. Take care, Keith.